In this video we cover the rotifers, which is a group of relatively small animals that show some uh, surprising complexity given their size. So again, these are the animals that we've covered in the past. Recently we covered, we got into the protostomia clade and covered the platyhelminths or flatworms. Now we're going to cover a relatively small group of really small animals, the rotifers. But remember, within this clade, we're talking about triploblastic, bilaterally symmetrical animals that show protostome patterns of development and in general show some high degrees of cephalization. There are about 2,000 species of these very small, microscopic marine and freshwater organisms. Most of them are found in freshwater. Um, some can also be found in really moist terrestrial environments. They are triploblastic. So they have endoderm, ectoderm, and mesoderm. And their epidermis is syncytial. Okay, so it's similar to what we covered in the uh, neodermata parasitic flatworms. So there is a con complete fusion of the cells associated with the epidermis. This is also covered by an external gelatinous layer. Now this is probably uh, primarily functional with regard to the fact that most of these are freshwater. And remember, if you're a freshwater organism, you have to work hard to keep water from invading your tissues. And so this may be a way to reduce that osmotic pressure. As far as symmetry goes, they are bilaterally symmetrical and do show a high degree of cephalization as we can see here in the anterior end. They don't really have too much in the way of support system as far as like a rigid support. They do have an internal sheet of proteins that's just under that syncytial epidermis. And they do primarily support themselves by hydrostatic pressure associated with their fluid-filled pseudoseal. So this is the first group of organisms we've talked about that does have an internal body cavity where they can change the amount of fluid in this body cavity to adjust the, the level of support that they have. And remember, a pseudoseal is a situation where you have mesoderm lining the outside of the body cavity, so it's next to the ectoderm but we do not have any type of uh, mesoderm lining the endoderm tissue. So that's what produces a pseudocelomate organism with a pseudoceal, a false body cavity. They have a really complex distribution of muscles that gives them a lot of potential movement as we're going to see in a minute. And so this figure here on the right is showing you some of the muscle bands that can be seen in rotifers. The figure on the left shows that they do have a clear head with a cerebral ganglion and then they have an, a series of nerves that radiate from that primarily in the longitudinal direction. They do show a concentration of sensory structures um, associated with the head so they have mechanical uh, and chemosensory structures associated with the spines and the antenna that are near the corona. And the, we'll talk about the corona in a minute, this ciliated ring around the organisms from which they really get their name. Some of the species that are more mobile um, also have photoreceptors. They have eye-like structures associated with their anterior end. So some of the rotifers are sessile, but most of them are pretty active pelagic swimmers. When they're not swimming, uh, the species that are pelagic, they can attach themselves to a substrate by these secretions produced by pedal glands. And these pedal glands are located associated with the adhesive toes. So the toes are areas that they can attach themselves to a substrate with uh, adhesive materials and then they can also secrete a releasing material uh, from uh, other pedal glands so that they can swim off. So that's on the posterior end of the animal. On the anterior end of the animal we have the head. Again we have uh, the brain or cerebral ganglion. Here we can see some of these eye spots or um, photoreceptors. But the, the reason they're called rotifers is because they look like they have a spinning wheel on their head. And that is created by this coordinated movement of these cilia in this ciliated corona. So the corona we're going to see is used for two main functions. One, to draw water and potential prey into the mouth for foraging, but that they can also use it to pull themselves forward through the water column so they can use it for swimming. One final point, um, species that are most pelagic actually do have some secondary loss of the toes and the adhesive glands associated with that structure. Again, if you're not going to use it, um, it's actually evolutionarily more advantage sometimes to lose a trait. 
Rotifers feed in, in two key ways, uh, or really I should say they're, they're feeding on two different types of organisms and they have some slight modifications associated with that. So they're all using their ciliated corona to draw food closer to them. In microscopic food particles, they um, then draw that into the mouth and into this structure called the uh, trophy, which are the jaws that help to chew up that material. But the chewing motion itself is actually produced by these muscular uh, regions in the pharynx, which is called the mastax. So the trophy are actually embedded within the mastax, and the mastax create the chewing motion that, that allows the jaws to work. And this organization of the mastax and the trophy is a synapomorphy for the rotifers. In the species that forage, so the other part of this I was talking about the two ways, the, the species that forage on larger prey items actually have some pretty nasty modifications associated with the spines associated with their corona. And they can also protrude their trophy, these jaws, to capture and bring in these uh, larger prey items. Here we see a little bit uh, better view of what I was showing you in the last uh, picture. We have the mastax, the uh, muscles associated with the internal, what would be internal of that are the trophy or jaws. So once food gets into the mouth, it then uh, goes through this muscular pharynx uh, and chewed up by the trophy. But then it's a relatively simple, straight digestive tract going down into uh, the stomach and intestines and then ends uh, by dumping waste into a cloaca. So a cloaca is a, a new term for you here. And a cloaca is a common chamber for at least the temporary storage of, of nitrogenous waste, digestive waste, and even the gametes will be placed here uh, during reproduction before they're put out into the outside environment. These are really small animals, lots of surface area, very little volume, and so they don't need a, a circulatory system or a respiratory system. A lot of this is uh, just taken uh, part osmosis and diffusion of materials across the epidermis and gastrodermis, and then there's also some movement of materials in that um, pseudoseal. As far as an excretory system goes, um, a lot of that can take place by diffusion as well, but they do have proteinephridia that are involved in that process to some degree. Uh, but primarily the function of the proteinephridia, again, because most of these are fresh water, is to regulate the amount of water that's in their body so that they don't get too much, so that they can get rid of a lot of that water using very dilute urine and get rid of that. And so they have, you can see here, a flame bu bulb associated with the proteinephridial system and the selective resorption in the tubules here that then dump the waste products uh, and excess water into the cloaca for elimination from the body. Like all the animals we've talked about so far, they really can't metabolically control their temperature, so they're ectotherms. Reproduction in rotifers is pretty interesting. So they, most of the time, they are reproducing asexually. And in some species, that's all we know that they do is just reproduce asexually through parthenogenesis. This is really common in species that have the capability of sexual and asexual, that in a stable environment, that's when they're gonna reproduce asexually. It's basically the idea here is, if you're in a stable environment and you're doing fine, just produce individuals just like you, and so make clones of yourself. Parthenogenetically, they do that by producing these diploid eggs that already have the right amount of DNA. They don't need sperm to fertilize them. So these females that do this are called amictic females. And they produce diploid eggs that then turn into other amictic clonal females. In species that we know that they are sexual, they do have a sexual life phase at least, they uh, are dioecious, so separate males and females. And that's because of kind of the way they're reproducing here. So we would see the, these species that are capable of sexual reproduction if the environment changes where it's not as stable, if it's a stressful environment or unpredictable environment, then you may not want to put all of your eggs in one genetic basket. You may want to produce individuals that have different genetic combinations and combine them with sperm that have different genetic combinations to guarantee that at least some of your offspring are going to be able to meet these new environmental challenges. So. If the environment changes and they go into a sexual cycle, instead of producing amictic females, they produce a mictic female. Now what this female can do is instead of producing diploid eggs, her gametes undergo meiosis to produce haploid eggs. All right, well think about this. If we start off with a population that was all females, 
these first unfertilized eggs, there's nothing to fertilize them, right? So these haploid eggs, if they are not fertilized, these turn into the males. The males themselves are haploid individuals. And they're teeny tiny compared to the size of the, the females. They're very simplistic morphologically. They don't forage. They don't have a digestive tract at all. Basically, they're just like a, a swimming testis. And they then mate with other females, other mictic females in the population, injecting their sperm. So this little structure that's shown right here, that's actually kind of a hypodermic syringe that they can inject their sperm into the female so that if she's producing, another female is producing haploid eggs, those become fertilized, and guess what? Those all turn into females. And usually it goes back into a asexual uh, cycle, so producing a, an amictic female. Could produce, it could go through multiple sexual cycles and produce uh, mictic females though. Once the zygotes begin to develop, uh, cleavage is holoblastic, kind of a modified spiral cleavage. It's, it's, it's spiral, like but it does have some deviations most of them are oviparous but there are some species that are ovoviviparous and in regard to what they do is they retain the zygote in kind of a, a dormant phase again if the environment isn't doing well then they wait for the environment to return to appropriate conditions before they release those zygotes to improve the chance that they are going to survive but again, in most cases, they're just shedding their gametes into the environment oviparously. They don't produce larval forms. Um, most of the adults themselves are fairly capable of dispersing, and so they just show direct development uh, into the adult form. Not really much known about the lifespan of rotifers. Um, probably relatively short uh, life cycles. They have pretty quick generation times, and so they reproduce, and, and individuals probably don't live long. They are, however, resistant to temperature changes and dryness for years. They can uh, form these dormant forms and um, wait for new appropriate conditions to occur. So uh, there's the potential for longer lifespan in specific individuals. Rotifer shows some interesting developmental patterns, one which is called developmental plasticity. And this is specifically related to some of their defensive capabilities. Individuals can grow spines if they detect chemicals of predators nearby. So if they detect predatory animals, they will grow these nasty spines that reduce the chances that those prey will eat them. If they're raised, however, in an area that doesn't show these predators, they don't mess around with producing these structures, which are going to be costly and time uh, intensive to produce. They instead use that energy to develop other parts of their structure. So that they have the same genes, but they develop these structures or don't develop the structures depending upon the, the environment that they're raised in. And so this is called developmental plasticity. Some rotifers um, that live sessily together, um, they do kind of live in these colonies, but there's really no kind of division of individuals operating in any kind of collective manner like soldiers or anything like that and so it's not really a clearly a social system it's more like just a, a gathering of individuals that have been produced asexually there are most of these as i mentioned are free living but there are a few commensal and parasitic species that live in or on other animals but again most of them are free living as I mentioned, most of them are fresh water, and so they face those challenges when we talk about the importance of the syncytial epidermis and the proteinuria for, for controlling their osmotic pressure. Um, but there are some that live in the marine environment and some that are semi-terrestrial, so they can live in really water-saturated soils or in really humid environments where water is covering the terrestrial plants on a consistent basis. And they can be found in some really extreme uh, aquatic environment, really cold polar waters, both north and south, and also really high salinity areas like mangrove swamps. As far as ocean acidification and, and climate change related to increased ocean temperatures, the direct effects on rotifers isn't really known. However, um, some species do rely on coral reefs, so in that regard, they would also be negatively impacted by climate change. So in review, this is a triploblastic bilaterally symmetrical group of organisms that show cephalization. They have this uh, syncytial epidermis with a gelatinous exterior covering that kind of helps them in osmoregulation. 
they're pseudocoelomates, and the pseudocoel is used in some ways as a circulatory system, uh, or not a system itself, but to move materials. It also supports the, the body hydrostatically, but in addition to hydrostatic support, there is a, a thin protein sheet that provides some support on the inside of the epiderm. Again, they show cephalization with a concentration of sensory structures on the head and also a cerebral ganglion that uh, coordinates nervous interactions. The corona is a synapomorphy for the group, so it is a ring of cilia that bead in a coordinated fashion that looks like a spinning wheel, and they use this for both locomotion and feeding. In forms that at least spend some time sessile, they have pedal glands and adhesive toes for attaching to the substrate, and they do have a complete digestive tract with a trophy, these jaws in a muscular pharynx called the mastax. They also have a cloaca, which is a common chamber for digestive waste, nitrogenous waste, and also for uh, gametes before they're released. Again, no real circulatory or respiratory system because they're small and fusion can take care of most of these uh, types of functions. But they do have proteinophridia that's primarily an osmoregulatory structure in freshwater species. Some species may be completely asexual, but in species that do show sexual reproduction, they cycle between an asexual and a sexual phase. And make sure that you know, you know which one is associated with mictic and amictic females and what environmental triggers are more likely to keep them in an asexual form or trigger a sexual form of reproduction and know the characteristics of males and how they're formed. They show holoblastic modified spiral cleavage. Most of them are oviparous, but some do show ovoviviparity with some retention of zygotes in a dormant phase to kind of give them protective barrier in times of stress and then release them when developmental conditions are better. They don't produce larvae. They just show direct development. But some do show development in different ways. They show developmental plasticity where they can grow spines or not grow spines depending on the environment they grow in and whether they sense that they're predators or not and whether they need that protective material. Most are free living, but we do show some commensal and parasitic species. And again, most are freshwater, but they can be fairly widespread in other aquatic and even some moist terrestrial habitats.